Hello, everybody, and welcome back to I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. This is episode number 104. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, now that we are, you know, I know you got married, you know, close to a year ago at this point on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, you've been married for like a month now. Uh, How is East Coast married treating you? (laughs) Uh, It's good. You know, as I mentioned last time, uh, we got sick. (laughs) At that one. Um, <laughs> but no, in general, it's been good. Um, one of the nice parts, and I'm sure you can kind of relate to this, Mike, uh, of working at... Being married? Insti- no, I can't. Well, an institution of, of learning is that you get a lot of time <laughs> off around the holidays. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, it was really great. So um, I got to just kind of hang out, unfortunately, for Liz. She had to uh, go back to work, although... Actually, no, we went back to work at the same time because uh, she was out for a full week of work because of COVID. Um, But yeah, just things have been very relaxed and uh, fairly stress-free. We got to go, ooh, that's a fun thing. We got to uh, go to this big, uh, I think it's called the Pennsylvania State Farm Show. I don't know what that is. Um, Sounds like there's a whole lot of uh, Amish there, if I had to guess. Um, I don't think I actually, I might've seen one or two Amish people, um, but they don't tend to go to these kinds of things. There was a lot of Mennonite folks though. Ah, uh, okay. That, I guess that makes a little bit more sense. Um, I mean, when it comes to the time off around the holidays, like you'll hear some people say, you know, don't go into teaching just cause you want time off around the holidays. And my whole thought nice. process is, yeah, right. Like don't make that the only reason you're going into teaching, but I mean, it's a pretty sweet gig. They just keep paying you. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, it really uh, is incredible. It's pretty sweet. And though, unfortunately, I don't have summers off uh, like you do. Um, mm-hmm. They The university that I work for is very generous with uh, vacation time. So, uh, And what university is that for everybody? Bucknell University, of course. Bucknell University. What's your uh, your team mascot? Or your team the name, bison. I guess? The bison. The Bucknell bison. Yep. There's actually an interesting story. Uh, to that that we don't have time to get into right now but it's vaguely paleontology e which i think is actually kind of neat um a story for another time perhaps but i am looking forward to that story for another time in the meantime gavin do you have some things to remind us of before we get started today i sure do so today we're going to be talking about theropod dinosaurs uh which if you're familiar at all with paleontology you might think how are you doing that in one episode uh and spoilers is we're not going deep we're gonna be uh in the kiddie pool of theropod dinosaurs today. Um, but before we get into the the meat of the episode, do not forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to us on and to follow us on our various social medias, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc., uh, to give us feedback about how the show is going and to suggest any future topics that you would like to hear about on the show. Uh, and if you'd like to be a guest on the show, there is a Google form down below in the show notes as well as a topic suggestion form. Uh, to fill out at your leisure and uh, all links to to the social medias and those Google forms and stuff can be found down in the show notes. And Mike, next episode ends in a five. How about that? Yeah. So um, I think I know the answer. Do you know what we're doing next week? I don't have a clue we're doing next week. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, But next week will be Mike takes the wheel volume nine. So if you're excited for that, make sure to let us know uh, on the YouTubes and the social medias and such. And uh, with Fia still out this week, she'll be back next week. Uh, that takes us right into our Today in History. What do you got, Mike? But just just to be clear, Fia's okay, everybody. The timing Oh, yeah, she's up, fine. Fia's doing just fine. Yeah, do not do not worry about Fia. She is still a uh, former number one fan of the podcast and still just, you know, best friend Fia. Yeah, her uh, well, her mom got to go visit her uh, down in the swamp for for the holidays, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's that's why she's taking some some well deserved time off. Absolutely, and she deserves it. So, as far as today in history goes, um, this is coming out. This is actually kind of one of the very very rare times when the um, the day we are recording this, as well as the actual day this is being released, are going to um, sync up with each other. Um, interestingly enough. So, Gavin, we are recording this on Monday, January 16th. What is today? January 16th, 2023. 
January 16th. Oh, um, that's inaug. No, not inauguration day. There's something with the 16th. I don't know. It's not the 16th specifically. It is just like, you know, there's a holiday today. Oh, <laughs> um, today is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I was getting a little bit worried there for a hot second, but yes, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so a couple things. Um, so in 1993, on January 18th, so again, we're recording this on the 16th, but um, on the day this comes out in 1993, January 18th, that was the first time that Martin Luther King Day was observed in all 50 states. Um, so we are, uh, I guess, the 30-year the anniversary of that. And it leads me to one of my favorite trivia questions. Is oh, geez. in oh okay, see I can't let anything uh, good stand. Um, in Alabama, this uh, particular day, so the sixteenth, is not just Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Gavin, can you guess what other famous um, American? I use that term lightly. Uh, is also celebrated in Alabama today. I'm guessing it's a Confederate. Um, I don't know enough about Alabama to know any of its notable people. Um, so no. It, it is not somebody who's notably from Alabama, but oh. it is Robert E. Lee. Ah. Uh, so in cool. addition to it being Martin Luther King Jr. Day, on the day we're recording this on Monday, it's also Robert E. Lee Day, which is just, you know, uh, come on, Alabama. Yeah. Alabama. And like, I've been to Alabama and the, the one part of it that I've been to is actually pretty nice. I liked going to Birmingham. That was actually a, a fun time. But, um, yeah, when you do stuff like this, Alabama, it really makes me want to just it. never go back. You earn the reputation. Yeah. Uh... So, yeah, that is, uh, that is today in history. So, um, we're learning about, you know, uh, the, the, the pods or something. We sure are. We learn about theropods. So theropods are one of the major group of dinosaurs uh, spanning all the way from the very first dinosaurs and spoilers all the way through till today. Uh, Wait, come again. They are a group of dinosaurs that spans in time from the very first ever dinosaurs around 225 or so million years ago all the way through until today. All right, are we going to get to that last part? Oh, we sure are. All right, I'm looking forward to that. But theropods, if you don't know what we're talking about, generally are the bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, with a handful of exceptions. Um, But if it's a dinosaur that walks around uh, on two legs, it is almost certainly a theropod. There's a couple of exceptions, um, especially of the famous ones. Um, And if it eats meat... It, it is a theropod um, and and it's a dinosaur. That's a pretty, pretty standard caveat. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about them, some of their features, their history, and some of the different groups. Like I said, this is one of the major groups of dinosaurs. And while we have done an episode about sauropod dinosaurs, which is, um, you know, sort of on the same sort of span of theropods here in terms of its like size and diversity... Uh, theropods are much more disparate is the technical word. Uh, they're, you know, sort of size and, and how they live their lives are very different from one another, whereas sauropods are just the giant long neck ones. And even the small ones were still big. So, and they all were herbivorous. They're all, uh, except for like the very early ones walked on four legs and, Uh, generally did very similar things in their environments. That was not true for theropods. So we're going to be talking about them as um, lightly as we can. And then at some point, any of these groups that we're going to talk about uh, could have their own episode by themselves. So. Okay. All right, let's get going. Theropoda is the name of the, like the technical name of the group, uh, which means beast foot, which is very strange. Um, because to me, as somebody, especially someone who mostly works with mammals, um, the sort of root that thero, the, the, the ther in theropod comes from means beast. And typically that's used with mammal things. If you hear 
a scientific name with Ethereum uh, in it, it is almost certainly a mammal. Um, and I'm not quite sure why they named this group that, but here we are. Um, the group was named by O.C. Marsh in 1881 in the very height of the Bone Wars by one of the Bone Wars guys. By one of the Bone Warriors, you might say? Absolutely. I've never heard that before, but that is absolutely what I will be referring to them as now. As you should. Um, but Marsh, famously, as good as he was, he also didn't know what he was doing. Um, he included lots of stuff that is not actually in this group, including things that are related to crocodilians, um, and ha- a handful of things that are also not even dinosaurs. So this group has been heavily modified since it was first named, but because of the way naming stuff works, the name stays. So this group, if you still can't picture it in your brain, includes most people's favorite dinosaurs, for example. Uh, also, pretty much every dinosaur that's ever made the news that you've seen. So this would be things like your Tyrannosaurus <laughs> rex, your Velociraptor, Spinosaurus, Archaeopteryx, as well as birds, which is why they're still around today. Birds? Okay, so... What kind of birds? All of them. We'll talk about it a little more later. I I have some follow-up questions, so let's get to that. Okay, we will we will circle around to that in in a little bit here. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to so, it. Let's talk about dinosaurs in general because it's been honestly a little while since we've talked about dinosaurs. Uh, we had an episode way back in episode two about dinosaurs, uh, but the early episodes are really bad and cringy. Uh, so let's just do a gentle recap. <laughs> <laughs> so. Dinosaurs are a group of reptiles called archosaurs, meaning that they have a set of features that they don't share with other groups of familiar reptiles like lizards and turtles, for example. Um, so these features generally include a more upright gait, unlike um, like a lizard where their legs are sort of sprawled out to the side. Archosaurs have their legs positioned more directly underneath them, like you would think of with like a mammal. Uh, their teeth are mm-hmm. put in sockets, very much like ours are. Whereas with lizards and stuff, they sort of just sit on like a little shelf inside their jaw and are very weakly held in place. Um, They have a couple of extra holes in the skull, specifically one sort of between the eye socket and uh, the nose hole, uh, the the nary as it's called. Um, And then they also have another hole sort of in their bottom jaw as well. Um, And all of that is true for both today crocodilians and dinosaurs um the modern crocodilians have gotten rid of some of those holes because they needed to bite real hard so they just made their skull really sturdy and got rid of some of the holes um but if you ever watch a crocodilian walk around on land they either sort of slide on their belly or they can pick themselves up off the ground and it's called doing a high walk and that is because they're able to put their legs underneath them because they're archosaurs, whereas lizards can't really do that. Dinosaurs... So are, oh, go ahead. Are crocodilians, like, theropods? No. So, um, I'm just doing this to get sort of a baseline of dinosaurs in general. Okay. So, crocodilians are... Ba- basically, I'm just saying all this to say crocodilians are more closely related to dinosaurs than they are to lizards, for example. And, okay. and why dinosaurs are different than other reptiles. Gotcha. So, both of those groups, dinosaurs and crocodilians, are archosaurs. And archosaurs are sort of split into those two sides. The dinosaurs and also the pterosaurs, the flying reptiles on one side, and then the crocodilians around the other. Main difference between those two is some stuff with their ankles and, and some different things with how their limbs are structured. Dinosaurs and their relatives basically have more mobile limbs and are more efficient in their limb movement, whereas the crocodilian side and all of their relatives has sort of more stable movements. Um, so different benefits for having them set up different ways, but that's how those two groups are sort of split. 
And these days, when we're talking about grouping different, you know, uh, species or, or genus or families into groups, we tend to group them, or we tend to define them mostly by their ancestry rather than their morphology. So basically who they're related to versus, you know, the, the shapes of their bones and things like that. Mostly because morphology is kind of messy and isn't always reflective of evolution. If that makes sense. Is say that one more time. It's not the morphology, it's the evolution. Right. Two that we, we group things together based on relatedness, not necessarily by shape. Uh, usually right. those two things go together because if you're more closely related, you're probably going to have a fairly similar shape. But right, this is like a correlation causation kind of thing. Right. Um, and so, and well, in some cases, this one is a correlation causation thing, but um, convergent evolution exists. So you, that's something that paleontologists especially need to be watchful for because all we have are the bones and sometimes uh, the bones are sort of deformed a bit by being fossilized. Mm-hmm. And I and I sort of explain that to sort of give the the modern definition for the group dinosauria, the dinosaurs, and try and try and stay with me here. The group dinosauria is defined as the most recent common ancestor of Triceratops hortus. So the, what you think of when you think of Triceratops, you know the three horns and the frill on the back of the head. Right. Diplodocus carnegii, which is a, a long neck dinosaur. And Passer domesticus, which is a house sparrow. Okay. okay. So, house sparrow. Yes, just a, a regular bird. And you could substitute in any bird there. They just picked that one because you need to pick a specific one for these kinds of definitions. So. Okay. It is defined as the most recent common ancestor of those three, Triceratops, Diplodocus, and a house sparrow, and all of that ancestor's descendants. For example, that covers things that are extinct. That's everything. Everything that That's is a dinosaur. That's so many different species. It is a lot of things. Okay. But, crucially, that doesn't include things like pterosaurs, those flying reptiles that doesn't include crocodilians that doesn't include uh like turtles or or lizards and snakes um so that is just the dinosaurs we're almost through the, this kind of denser heavy stuff and then we just get to talk about the cool animals so give me I like just quickly real a couple minutes i just quickly want to want to yeah. um so theropods cover like you know most dino- the bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, they do not cover the flying dinosaurs. However, all birds that are around today, including flying birds, are theropods. So, do I have that correct? Uh, no, because you said flying dinosaurs when you meant flying reptiles. Because pterosaurs, flying okay, or flying reptiles, they they are not dinosaurs. They are sort of the next closest right. cousin to dinosaurs. But they're not right, dinosaurs. and we've talked about this before. Okay, right. I and, was I, and I will correct, I will t- even if my words were wrong. Right, yeah. And so I will explain more about the birds. Other, uh, they have their own section later. So just sort of table that for the moment. And so that, so that is dinosaurs. No problem. The most recent common ancestor of those three things, and everything that has descended from that ancestor, and that's how we define groups of animals or even plants, although plants get messy, um, these days. And so normally you sort of split dinosaurs in general, the entire group dinosaurs into ornithischia and saurischia. Those are the technical names. You'll usually hear them called the bird hipped dinosaurs and the lizard hipped dinosaurs. Uh, spoilers, birds are not where you think. Um, and again, we'll get there. Uh, so okay. ornithischia, the quote unquote bird hipped dinosaurs include your ceratopsians like triceratops, armored dinosaurs like stegosaurus and Kylosaurus, uh, ornithopods, your duckbill sort of dinosaurs, 
those are all off on the bird hip side. The other side, the saurischia or lizard hips, are the sauropods, which we've already talked about, and the theropods, which we're going to talk much more about today. Notably, Mm -hmm. the birds are not on the bird hip side. That's one of those examples of convergent evolution that I mentioned, and why morphology and the shape of the bones doesn't always help you. <laughs> it's also an example of just confusing naming. Exactly. And that's that's why I try to just use... And, and, and most people that try to communicate science uh, try to just use the scientific names and explain them as best as we can without using the literal meaning, because often it's not quite correct and then requires like five more minutes of explanations okay like so normally you'll just hear them by somebody who like actually you know is decent at explaining science just use the scientific names because bringing in the bird stuff just confuses people more anywho some people have sort of recently suggested that the sauropods should be off on their own and that the theropods should be with all the other dinosaurs that's a topic for another time. It hasn't really been supported in the last handful of years, but I thought I'd throw it in there. Anywho, mm-hmm. um, like I said, the distinction between the two main groups is in that hip structure. Um, in the ornithischia, they have uh, their pubis, which is a, a bone in the hips that sort of points backwards like it does in modern birds. And in the saurischia, it faces forward like it does in lizards. Uh, however, in some groups of theropods, it evolved to be backward facing as well, which is where the confusion comes from. Okay. Dinosaurs in general, out of the way. That's all the, the sticky, messy stuff that's confusing. Now we're just going to be talking about the, the fun, cool animals. So. Firstly, this is the only group of dinosaurs, t- to my knowledge, I, I don't do much with dinosaurs, um, but that is exclusively bipedal. Okay. If you so think, if you think what of, are some of the groups of dinosaurs that, uh, that we could be talking about here that are not exclusively bipedal? So most groups of dinosaurs started off bipedal in their very, very early evolution. Um, so for example, mm-hmm. like the very early relatives of like Triceratops um, had much smaller heads So they weren't just sort of toppling over, Um, but they, they were bipedal. Um, The early sauropod relatives were still really big. um, And they had sort of hybrid walking and grabby hands. So they were sometimes walked on all fours, but they could stand up and grab stuff with their hands if they wanted to. Um, And then some others are what are called uh, facultatively bipedal which uh, these are some more of like the duck bill dinosaurs where when they're just sort of walking, it's easier to be on uh, all fours. But then when they need to run, they can just sort of pick up their front arms and run that way. And that's more efficient for them when they need to run instead of just cruising around. Yes. Okay. Yep. I got you. That makes, that actually makes sense to me now that I'm just imagining it in my head. Yep. Cool. So if you are thinking of a bipedal dinosaur, like 99% of the time, it's going to be a theropod. Um, And theropods have specifically three load-bearing toes on their back legs. So imagine the T-Rex stomping in like a pile of mud in Jurassic Park. That is sort of the standard theropod foot. Some others like um, Velociraptor and its various relatives have the one big claw that they evolved to sort of lift off the ground so they only kind of have two toes on the ground. Uh, But for the most part, they have the sort of T-Rex from Jurassic Park style foot. Um, And they also had sort of an extra dew claw that was held up off the ground. Uh, Many groups of birds today have four toes. For example, lots of like woodpeckers have sort of two toes in the front and two toes facing backwards so they can hang on to trees uh, sort of vertically. Um, and that's where the extra toe comes from. And that seems convenient. Yeah. Um, nowadays, if you watch anything fairly recent with theropods, uh, they 
depict them walking at least correctly. Not much else about them is depicted correctly. Um, but they walk with their spine and tail more or less horizontal to the, or, or parallel to the ground. Um, old Older depictions looked sort of like Godzilla with the tail dragging on the ground and the back sort of upright like a human's back. Um, but that's not correct. That would break their tail and probably lots oh, of really? their bones. Yeah. Okay. Um, famously, uh, their arms and specifically their hands um, couldn't like rotate. So if you used to just sort of hold your hand out in front of you and face your palm toward the ground and then rotate it up so your palm's now facing the ceiling, they couldn't do that. Um, their, Which part of their body couldn't move properly for that? Um, so basically how we do it is one of your forearm bones sort of rotates around the other one a little bit. They couldn't the, do uh, that. The radius and ulna? Correct. Right. And I, and I forget which one rotates around which other one. I think the radius moves around the ulna. Um, sure. But anywho, um, they couldn't do that. They couldn't do that rotating motion. And often you'll see them depicted with their palms facing down, sort of in like a creepy pose. So if, if you were like trying to sneak and you have like your hands sort of up against your body, you're sneaking around, your palms are facing down, they couldn't do that. Um, the way it's often phrased is that they were clappers. They could clap their palms together, but they were not slappers. They could not like slap their knee um, or like their thighs or whatever. So they <laughs> could, yeah. Um, okay. So if you ever see them in that sort of creepy creeping pose, uh, that's wrong. Um, and then lastly, Noted. before we get into uh, their, their sort of timeline is intelligence, because that has come up. Uh, a lot for this group. And especially recently, there's actually something just like in the past, like week or two uh, about it. Uh, Intelligence in animals is a very complex topic and we don't really know how to measure it. Well, even in living animals, let alone ones whose brain we've never gotten a chance to like look at and dissect and stuff. So uh, specifically in things like Velociraptor and its relatives with like, you know, like pack hunting behavior and, and forming groups and things like that. We have very little evidence for that. Um, and specifically just because I think it's interesting that this sort of came up, uh, a recent paper sort of hypothesized that T-Rex was roughly as smart as a baboon and hypothetically could live long enough to develop complex cultures like we see in primates. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, is that, I guess I would need some context for that. Like, is that is that very intelligent? Is that, you know, like on average, is like I, that seems impressive to me, but I guess I just don't know what I'm talking about. On that. Outside of things like primates and um, whales and dolphins and things. And then also, you know, the you social insects like ants and bees and stuff that form like hives and communities like that, that, that is very rare. Um, However, several people, as soon as, I don't even think this was officially published. I think it was, I think it's still currently being peer reviewed, but several people uh, who I know who like work on like T-Rex and stuff were like, "Mm, I don't think they're like, I I don't think like what they, I don't think their conclusion is wrong. I think that they can't make that conclusion from what they said, you know? So it's like, I don't know that it's Mm -hmm. wrong. I don't have evidence saying that they couldn't, you know? Um, but saying that about any animal is complex. And we, like I said, we are just not good at judging the intelligence, even of other people, realistically, let alone other animals that we can't (laughs) communicate with. Um, right. So anywho, I, I just thought I'd mention it because it was neat and, and in the news. Yeah. So all of that sort of generic theropod things out of the way. Let's talk about some specifics here. Theropods were some of the earliest dinosaurs of all of them. They show up basically right when we see the very first dinosaurs. They are either theropods or extremely closely related. Whenever a new group of life shows up, there's always some things that are very similar, but not quite in the group. You know, just because there's a lot of things around, you know, sort of competing for that niche that are all somewhat closely related. And so 
uh, the earliest dinosaurs show up, like I said earlier, around 225 million years ago in the middle of the Triassic period. And some of the early ones that you'll see talked about are uh, a, a genus called Eodromius and the family Herrerasauridae. Uh, Herrerasaurs sort of go back and forth whether or not they're true theropods or not. Like I said, one of those groups that's like early. So it's like they have some weird features that fit and then some other ones that sort of don't. Um, and lots of things that are just sort of confusing about them. So some people generally consider them theropods. Other people don't. This is why I added so many caveats at the beginning where it's like, for the most part, if it is a carnivorous dinosaur, it's a theropod. These are like the potential, like one exception. Okay. The earliest sort of undisputed ones are a little bit later than that. Um, and the very famous early one uh, is called Coelophysis. And uh, if you ever saw Walking with Dinosaurs as a kid, I know I did. And also when I worked at the uh, museum in South Dakota, we had a copy of it on DVD. I would play it almost every shift that I worked. Um, Can you s pronounce that one more time? Coelophysis. It's, it's not spelled how you think. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so it was... Uh, about waist height or so, uh, but very long, around like 10 feet long, and somewhere in the ballpark of 35 to 55-ish pounds. Um, and for theropods, it had a, a handful of weird things. It had four fingers on each hand, which a lot of later theropods no longer have. Most of them only have two or three. Um, some other famous ones that you might find from this early, early kind uh, are Procompsognathus. A very little tiny dinosaur um, that is featured a lot in some of the Jurassic Park movies, the ones that kind of swarm uh, the people that are like maybe knee height or so. Um, of course, they just they sort of make them into like army ants, where it's like anything they come across they just destroy, um, which is probably not true. But <laughs> I thought if anything that was featured in Jurassic Park, I'm gonna sort of throw in here just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, it might have been featured in some of the later Jurassic Park movies, but they're bad, and I'm not going to rewatch them to find out. So, um, are you going to continue watching any of the Jurassic Park movies? Because I just like it's not good <laughs> at this point. Hopefully, they will not make another one in like the same franchise, sort of like how Star Wars made like Rogue One and is now doing other franchise things like the shows yes. and stuff. Um, right. I hope that they end up doing that and that they're good because some of the Star Wars shows have been really good. Um, anyway, unless they do that kind of thing, probably not because the last couple have just been real bad. <laughs> Anywho. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of dinosaur bearing rocks from the late Triassic. So a lot of some of these transitions aren't super clear. Um, but it's thought that pretty much all of the later theropods evolved from Coelophysis and its very immediate close relatives. So um, really important group to look at for why theropods were the group that, you know, ended up taking over the world. And as we'll see, they do just about everything. Uh, there, unfortunately for, uh, for paleontologists, there was a big old mass extinction at the end of the Triassic period. So while dinosaurs made it through, they didn't make it through completely unscathed. So, uh, the early Jurassic right after the extinction, uh, there aren't a ton of rocks with a ton of fossils. So in the earliest Jurassic period from around 200 million to 180 million, um, we don't have a great picture, but we do know that theropods become very diverse and become much, much bigger. How much not bigger is the, uh, much bigger? Not quite the giants you're thinking of with like T-Rex and stuff yet. But like I okay. said, Coelophysis was maybe waist high or so. 
some of the early Jurassic dinosaurs, such as Dilophosaurus, uh, also famously from Jurassic Park, uh, was quite big. Um, although everything about Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park is wrong. Uh, it's the little one with the frill that spits venom. Right. Everything about that's wrong. Um, I would say, there, I imagine there's no venom. This one was actually quite. What's that? I imagine there's no venom. Or frill. Yeah, there's no evidence for either of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually a pretty big animal. Uh, it was around 25 feet long, which at the time would have made it around the largest known land animal, not just predator, but land animal uh, on North America at the time. Uh, and also was around 900 or so pounds. So this was, was a big animal. Right. A little bit later, in the sort of early to middle Jurassic period, some, we see some of the larger, more diverse groups show up, uh, such as the ceratosaurs, which we'll talk more about in a bit, uh, which generally had some sort of head ornamentation. Um, this group sort of includes the you know namesake ceratosaurus, which had a bit of a horn on the end of its nose. Um, Sort of like a triceratops horn that it has on his nose, but a little more blunt instead of being pointy. Um, Carnotaurus uh, is another famous one that has sort of horns coming off sideways on either side of its head. Uh, and then this group also includes the abelisaurs. More on them later, because they're real weird. The sort of other group of the ceratosaurus has a weird name. The Tetanure, which is something to do with their tail. But anyway, this is most of like your well-known groups. For example, that includes uh, everything from your T-Rex to your Velociraptor to, uh, I, I believe, like Spinosaurus as well is in this group. So the first group that would branch off into all of those, early middle Jurassic. And this is post that mass extinction event, all of this? Right. Okay. And so this part in my notes is titled Quick Bird Aside. So here's, here's where <laughs> Here we, we can, go. yeah, here's where we can answer some of your bird questions, Mike. So thank you. The group that includes birds, all like the, the close relatives of birds, you'll usually see a, a couple of other groups of dinosaurs thrown around. The dromaeosaurs, which includes things like your Velociraptor, Deinonychus, uh, the sort of smaller, more lightly built ones. Um, the oviraptors, which haven't really been in a good piece of media, so those are a little harder to describe. Um, and your trudontids, which also haven't really been in much media, so they're, they're a little tougher to just have a picture of. But something similar-ish to... Um, a small feathered velociraptor. Depending on what you mean when you say bird, that changes when the group shows up and what's included in that, if that makes sense. So most people kind of assume when they hear that birds came from dinosaurs, that it happened after the extinction, the, the one that killed off the rest of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. Uh, that's not true at all, uh, depending on, like I said, what you mean when you say bird. They showed up anywhere from the Middle Jurassic period through the Middle Cretaceous period. So let's go through so go, let's go through a couple of definitions here. So I guess, Mike, if if you had to say what is a bird, just give like a couple of things. What what would you say makes a bird? Yeah, we've done this before. We um, sure have. Um, I I. Bipedal, um, taking a clue from earlier in this episode, if they're therapized <laughs> and they have to be bipedal. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm assuming they don't have to be carnivorous, although I'm questioning that based on the beginning of this episode. Uh, I'll say they have to be carnivorous, just going with the theme of you giving right. me the answers at the beginning of the test. Sure. Um so I'll say that um, I don't like not necessarily flying, but like some sort of wing component. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like penguins; they can't fly, but right. they still have little like flappers. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, beaks, 
some sort of beak component. Um, uh, that's probably where I want to. Okay. That's probably as far as I'm going to get for now, I think. Okay. No, that was, that was good. Um, okay. How good was like it? Like I said, well, it was, it was actually quite good. But like I said, depending on how you define it changes because different people weirdly define bird different ways. So, and, and the problem with that is the old traditional system that we used to have of classifying things. So the kingdom phylum class order family genus species. So aves, which is birds is a class reptilia is also a class but if dinosaurs are reptiles and birds are dinosaurs birds must also be reptiles so that kind of falls apart so that's sort of when people started looking at okay how do we actually define bird now so Mm -hmm. if you mean all reptiles more closely related to birds than to crocodilians, which would work today because we don't have any other dinosaurs around. Um, That is one way to define it. I don't know personally anybody who defines it that way, but that is an option. Um, Birds or aves can mean all advanced archosaurs with feathers. Feathers are a big component for what makes a bird. Um, And so... Technically, that could include pterosaurs because pterosaurs were kind of fuzzy and depending on the, you know, various stages in evolution that could be seen as feathers. And if that does, that would include all dinosaurs, which, again, I don't know anybody who uses that definition. AVs could mean feathered dinosaurs that could fly, which I think most people kind of tend to agree more with. And the more technical definition, it could mean the last common ancestor of all the living birds and all of its descendants. So I feel like last a lay person. Ancestor. What's that? Yeah. I'm just trying to follow your, follow what you're saying here. Right. So if you mean the most recent common ancestor of all the living birds today, that is much more recent than has feathers and flies. I can believe that. So the first things that had feathers and could fly with them show up in the sort of latest part of the Jurassic, somewhere around 160 million years ago or so. They looked a bit different than our modern birds did. Um, They had longer tails. You know, birds only have a couple. They have a tail actually kind of similar to ours, which just a couple of bones fused together uh, into. In birds, it's called a pygo style, uh, but it's what they attach their tail Mm -hmm. feathers to. Um, But in these guys, even though they could fly, uh, they still had a longer bony tail. They also had teeth in their beak, depending... The earliest ones were unsure if they had like an actual covering of their beak or whether it was just a more typical dinosaur snout. Um, But they still had teeth, which is very different for birds today. No bird around today has, you know, true teeth. They might have little like spikes on their on their beaks, but they don't have actual teeth. Uh, And they had sort of uh, some fingers free on their front wings and even had their hind legs kind of turned into wings in some of them, which is weird. What, and uh, what you said, they used to have teeth, but like really don't anymore, correct? Right. When About when did that, about when do we see just like no more teeth existing? Um, sometime probably clo- much closer to the big mass extinction that takes out the dinosaurs. So I'd say sometime mm-hmm. closer to 100, maybe 90 million years ago or so. Um, but there okay. are also lots of other groups of birds around that for all intents and purposes, you would see that up in a tree and say it's a bird, you know, by, by that point, they didn't have their long tail anymore. Um, but then they'd smile at you and have teeth and, uh, you'd be scared because I'd be scared of birds with teeth. (laughs) Yeah, that would be, I'm sure there's like some subreddit Photoshop competition that has that. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, I'm out. I'm out on that. 
Um, and then lastly with the birds, uh, always the fun anecdote that T-Rex lives lived closer in time to us today than it did to Archaeopteryx, the first bird. That's, I, hearing different variations of that statistic always just like blow my mind. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I learned it, I was like, the the math is mathin, like the numbers are are working, but I I don't want to believe it. Yep. So that was the end of my bird segment. But do you have any lingering bird questions? You know, it's just wild how I suppose I almost compare this to like, you know, if I like pull on my toe i can sometimes feel that you know like up in my butt cheek or something <laughs> how everything's connected and just okay. like you can go so far back and find something that is connected to like dinosaurs and birds and this and that and it's just it is wild just how interconnected so many different things are um and that we've been able to trace that you know uh i, I don't know uh, genealogy or whatever the correct term mm-hmm. is all the way back yeah uh it's just it it's more just awe than any actual like question or thought. Yeah, I I definitely get that. And it's it always kind of bugs me when people like with birds specifically, people who are evolution skeptics, uh say like we don't have transitional fossils. I'm like, literally go look at anything to do with the evolution of birds because we understand that evolution really really well. And there are very clearly things sort of at different quote unquote stages where it's like a very bird like dinosaur that then becomes slightly more bird like fully feathered. The tail gets shorter. The teeth get smaller. Um, the, the, you know, wings, you know, the arms get longer and the, the hands fuse up into wings. And we, we see all of the steps very clearly along the way, which especially since birds are small, uh, and small things don't tend to fossilize well is remarkable that we have as much information as we do. Mm-hmm. Anywho, we're going to have to speed run a little bit here because we're coming up on uh, getting close to an hour. But now we really get to just be like, hey, look at this one. It's pretty cool. All right. So by this point, we're in sort of the middle of the Jurassic period. Give or take uh, like a hundred and... 70 million years ago or so. Theropods basically just continue to grow in diversity and also size throughout the course of the Jurassic. And by the end, we have large theropods such as Allosaurus, a very, very famous one uh, from here in North America, from uh, like around Utah. That was a very famous one that was named in the Bone Wars. Um, A related but slightly bigger one, which also just has a great name called a Sorophaganex, which means uh, something lizard eater, which I just I just think it's a fun name. Um, and Big also time. Torvosaurus. Anyone call something a lizard eater. Yeah, I feel like that should be an insult, right? Right. Like a middle school insult. <laughs> well, we don't have lizards where I grew up, so maybe not. <laughs> um. But yeah, so Allosaurus, Sorophaganex, and then also Torvosaurus were all roughly similar in size at the end of the Jurassic period in the 30 to 35-ish foot long range, and in the two to three and a half foot, or two to three and a half tons, uh, with Allosaurus being sort of on the lower end of that and Sorophaganex being on the higher end. So, like I said, like 30-ish foot long, three-ish ton animals, so... Not at all small by any means. Bigger than any predator that we have around today. Mm -hmm. Smaller ones often kind of get forgot in these things because A, we have less of them because like I said earlier, smaller things just fossilize less well. So we just have less of them. But also they're not as fun. uh, So they're not talked about as much. But they were also doing lots of things. So um, smaller ones like I mentioned earlier, Ceratosaurus, which was that one that I mentioned sort of had the horn on its head was vaguely person-sized, um, maybe about four and a half, five feet tall, but like 20 feet long because their tails were really long, uh, and about a thousand pounds. They were also doing um, 
some things here in North America as well. The, the rest of these are going to be very North America centric because they tend to be the ones that are more famous. <laughs> okay. Um, although notably, we're going to be talking about some uh, global South ones as well, because uh, there's a really interesting split between the North and the South later. Um, so like I said, these guys, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Saurophaganex, they were all kicking around at the end of the Jurassic period. And at the end of the Jurassic, there's not like a major mass extinction like there is at the end of the Triassic or at the end of the Cretaceous, but there is sort of a turnover. Sort of the, the groups that were doing good things at the end of the Jurassic are not the same that are doing the good things at the beginning of the Cretaceous. So it's just sort of a some kind of smaller scale mass extinction happened. Right. And once we get into the Cretaceous, we see again, just another explosion in the diversity around this time is when you see the dromaeosaurs, which are the Velociraptor and friends, uh, oviraptors, which are similar, but more ostrichy in proportion, if that makes sense, longer legs, longer, sort of more upright necks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, trudontids, which are sort of the closest thing to birds that is still very dinosaur-y. Uh, they all popped up throughout the Cretaceous and were all likely covered in feathers. Um, and these groups sort of range from small to medium dog-sized, and then a handful of individuals that were, you know, well over human-sized, for sure. And these were sort of your... the, the modern-day equivalent of, like, a fox doing that kind of ecological thing. The small predators eating, you know, the small prey. Around sort of the same size range, we start to get some of the groups that then secondarily became herbivorous. I mentioned earlier that you have to sort of combine the walks on two legs and the carnivorous because not all of them are carnivorous. And that sort of gets back to what you mentioned with birds earlier, uh, where it's no, not all birds are herbivorous because some of them secondarily ended up eating vegetables again. And that's true of some of these dinosaurs as well. So some of these that became herbivorous or at the very least omnivorous, uh, one group is called the ornithomimosaurs, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it basically just means things that look like birds. Um, and they more or less just look like ostriches, but with arms and tails. Which, Mike, we when you went out to California, we took you to see some ostriches and some emus. And uh, they're pretty scary, I'm not going to lie. So I, the arms are what does it for me. I would not want an ostrich yeah. to be running at me with arms. Yeah, that would, you know, neither, like, tail, too. Like, that would be an underrated portion of it. But, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, the... That would that would scare me a little bit if uh, if an ostrich with a tail that knew how to use it. Yeah, it was mostly for like running balance, um, but ostriches don't have one because their ancestors lost it, and it's pretty hard to regrow something that you know your ancestors did away with. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know we don't have snakes with legs because regrowing <laughs> body parts is hard. Um, and so these were, this group was mostly ostrich-ish sized as well. So these would be, um, the the really famous one is Gallimimus. Uh, from Jurassic Park, you see them sort of running together in like a flock, I guess. And they even talk about how much they move like birds in, in the movie. Um, and those are a bit bigger than they probably would have been in real life. But like I said, vaguely ostrich sized for this group. And many lacked teeth, but they were like, I saw a couple things say that they were at least omnivorous. And I'm like, I don't know how you're eating stuff. Cause you're not that big to just be eating stuff whole, but you also don't have teeth. So square that circle. Yeah. That seems like an interesting pair. Yeah. And the other major group of herbivorous theropods are my personal favorite theropods because they're so stinking weird. The Therizinosaurs, which look more or less like a chubbier 
ornithomimosaurs, the things we just talked about. So it's like a chubby ostrich with uh, a tail and arms. Chubby ostrich with tail and arms. Okay. Right. They kind of have like a big, like almost beer gut on all (laughs) of these ones. Okay. But the reason that I like them is because they famously had really, really long claws. Uh, the like how long is really really long? Oh, it depends on you know they they range in size from uh, slightly smaller than like the typical person all the way up to the biggest one, which was Therizinosaurus, uh, which was about thirty feet long, about fifteen feet tall, and weighed about five tons. And it had claws, so it had three claws on each hand that were around three ish feet each claw. <laughs> um, and funnily <laughs> enough it's likely that they were used to just grab tree branches and pull them closer to their face. Uh, and I'm sure it also helped them look big and scary as well. Uh, I, I would bet. Yeah. It's, you know, Wolverine doesn't have anything on these guys. <laughs> so, but they're, they're just really goofy looking. Um, for example, I know, I don't think you have, but if any of the listeners saw Jurassic world dominion, the most recent one, um, the thing that kills the the bad dinosaur at the end, that is a Therizinosaurus. And that one's size actually isn't all that off either. Maybe it's a little big, but not by a lot. Anyway, my favorites aside, uh, moving on to some of the more iconic ones. The Spinosaurids, like Spinosaurus, Baryonyx, and Suchomimus, uh, they showed up in sort of the middle of the Cretaceous, and these were um, fish specialists mostly. So they would live in like stream or river environments and had very narrow snouts um, and generally longer arms, not as big as like the, the Therizinosaurs, but they had longer arms to be able to uh, grab fish with their, with their hands. Um, and some of the smaller ones were again, vaguely human sized but very long uh, all the way up to in sort of the middle late Cretaceous, Spinosaurus, and it's much less talked about sort of cousin Oxalia, which were tipping the scales at 40 to 50 feet long and six to eight tons, somewhere in that ballpark. <laughs> six to and eight tons, good God. Okay. For, for reference, a, like, a big elephant is probably about nine tons. Unreal. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, especially in the case of Spinosaurus, that was mostly eaten fish <laughs> and it got that big. Mm-hmm. And we're, I'm not going to talk about anything with Spinosaurus being aquatic or not. We're already a little low on time and that's a whole thing by itself. We can uh, have is, a that, is that a controversy? It. Yeah. It's got some weird features and like, like some things that just don't seemingly make sense if it wasn't like aquatic. Mm-hmm. but some features that say it definitely wasn't. So it's, it's kind of a thing. It, and it's honestly kind of a meme in like the paleontology Facebook groups that I'm in. And it's oh. like, Oh, <laughs> new Spinosaurus news. Oh okay. boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we can have a whole episode about uh, the Spinosaurus family uh, at some point. And so lastly, we get to, the last two groups of big dinosaurs. First, we have the Tyrannosaurs in the northern continents and the Abelisaurs and Carcharodontosaurs in the south. Carcharodontosaurs. Yep, and we'll we'll get to that in a second. Um, okay. First, the Abelisaurs, which I mentioned earlier, are famous for just being weird. Uh, they all show very greatly reduced arms, even more than you think of when you think of something like T-Rex. Um, the most famous one being Carnotaurus in South America, which was about 30 feet long, 12 feet tall or so. So a big animal. Uh, and its arms were like less than a foot long or so. Less than a foot. Yeah. Its arms were so tiny, like given more time, it probably would have just lost them. So, and they're so short and so weird because they don't have any wrist bones. Wrist bones just gone. And they 
greatly reduced the forearm bones, the, or the radius and the ulna, to basically become the wrist bones. So it has mm-hmm. no forearm. It just goes upper arm, hand. And <laughs> for the most part, they face backwards as if it's like Naruto running. Um, Excellent. Very strange. I, now that's in my head. Yep, sure is. Um, and in general, Carnotaurus and its relatives have really blunt faces, um, sort of like a bulldog as composed or as opposed to like, uh, like a lab, which has, you know, a longer face, whereas bulldogs just have like the really short, you know, blunt faces, Mm -hmm. but they were generally sort of lean and lightly built and were good, like chasers and also had some kind of these weird crests on their heads and things. So just really strange, really weird group. And they were found uh, in South America. I think some found in like Madagascar. So Southern continents. And the other su- Southern group, uh, the Carcharodontosaurs, which means shark to- shark tooth lizards named after uh, the, I think it's the genus of great white sharks, which is uh Carcharodon. So that's, that's pretty cool. I like that name a lot too. It's just a fun name to say, like Carcharodon. Yeah. yeah. So this group includes three real giants. And this would be Carcharodontosaurus, Mapusaurus, and Giganotosaurus, which was the bad guy in uh, Jurassic World Dominion. It Not a good movie. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and these lived in South America, Africa, Probably Australia and Antarctica too, but no fossils of them have been found there. But they were all fairly recently connected by by this point. They were all separate, I think, by this point, but recently connected. So I'd be surprised if there weren't any there. We just haven't found them yet. Um, and this group generally had really long snouts and sort of sort of really short skulls, like uh, top to bottom. So they weren't didn't have these big sort of domed skulls it was very sort of long and top to bottom narrow um and that means that for their size they actually had relatively weak bites um it's still really big animals and we'll talk about their size in a bit um but compared to some other ones that were more adapted for just grabbing something and crushing it these had more like slicing bites so they could just sort of tear chunks out of still living things instead of just grabbing it and wrestling it down. Um, and the the two sort of bigger ones, Carcharodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus, both got to about the max size that we've ever found in these theropods. They were about 40 to 50, usually shorter than that, maybe like 40 to 45 feet long. And seven to eight tons. So around the same weight as Spinosaurus. uh, With Mapusaurus being a little smaller than that. So. And these were not at all unusual. There were lots of theropods that like consistently hit these giant sizes. Because most people kind of think it's just T-Rex. Which we're going to talk about here in a second. But no, there were lots of T-Rex sized things that are like maybe slightly smaller but not noticeable if you were looking at the thing, you know? So like measurable, but not like significant. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And lastly, we have the Tyrannosaurus from Eurasia and North America. And instead of having that sort of longer, narrower skull, they had a skull adapted for extreme bite forces. They have these really high domed, really deep skulls. Uh, And they also had relatively blunt teeth at the back of their mouth, purely for just crushing up bone. When we say like extreme bite force, how extreme is extreme? Um, Oh, for sure. Higher than anything around today. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, And I'd have to like, look at like how it converts to like, you know, pounds per square inch or whatever. But, um, like what about a bear trap? You're you're asking the hard hitting questions here, Mike. I I do not have that answer. All right, can we work on that? Figure figure that out for the next episode. Sure thing, buddy. You you got it. <laughs> T Rex versus bear trap. 
Now I want to know. Now, now I'm only more <laughs> curious than I was 10 seconds ago. Um, well, given that bear traps don't cut your leg off, uh, I'd actually be more inclined to say T-Rex, to be honest. Okay, um, there we go. We, now we have our answer. Uh, but yeah, they, they also had, in addition to this like high domed skull, which just like a, is more like stable under high stresses that you'd get from a strong bite force, they have uh, a sort of crest on the top of their head for muscle attachments, very much like you see in dogs. If you like scratch a dog's head, especially like a German shepherd or something like that, um, you'll feel like a bone sort of at the top, sort of almost to the back of their head. Um, and if you follow it sort of forward toward their nose, it forms like this crest that the big chewing muscles on either side of it attach to. Most dinosaurs didn't have that kind of crest, but T-Rex and its relatives did. Just to get that much more bite force out of it. And there were medium-ish ones around in the early Cretaceous. Um, like I said, that vaguely human size to maybe a little bigger than that. Um, but toward the end of the Cretaceous, they got real big. Notably, Eutyrannus in Asia was about 30 feet long and about a ton, uh, and also was fully feathered. So this was one that we have like excellent fossils of, where it's like, this was really big and also fully feathered, which was, you know, a little controversial when it first was discovered. Really big and fully feathered. I feel like that should be the subtitle of a movie. <laughs> I, I don't know what the what the full title of that movie would be. Right. Right. Like you know, like you know, but, Hulk Seven, really big and fully feathered or something. Like I don't know. But. <laughs> um yeah, so U Tyrannus was over in Asia. Gorgosaurus, Desplatosaurus, and Albertosaurus were over here in North America, and were all also roughly thirty feet, but a bit heftier. They were like two to three tons. And then the two sort of giants that you'll see with Tyrannosaurus are Tarbosaurus in Asia, basically Asia's version of T-Rex, which was around 35 feet long, about five tons. Uh, so marginally smaller than we'll see with Tyrannosaurus Rex here in North America, which was around 40 feet and somewhere between six to eight tons on, on the high end. And one last thing to end off our episode that I thought was really cool and one of my favorite uh, studies that I ever that I've ever read about dinosaurs because as Mike mentioned before we started recording, uh, I typically don't like dinosaur research mostly because of like the culture around dinosaurs. Um, right, it, right. Absent the larger context, it would be no different than anything else. But just like right, yeah, it's yeah, mostly the, just the the media and culture around dinosaurs that makes me typically not enthusiastic about dinosaur research. Um, right. But this one was actually quite cool because. Um, they did it specifically talk about tyrannosaurs and the, these really big ones, these like 30 plus footers. Um, and I assume that it would be similar for the other really large groups that were down in like South America and, and Africa and stuff, but they, I don't think they tested those, but in the environments that these big tyrannosaurs lived, there were no medium sized predators. There was just the little sort of Fox, you know, waist height or maybe a little bigger than that ones. And then the giants. And they were like, that's weird. There should be. Cause if you look at, you know, places like, um, like East Africa and like the Savannah stuff, you see like the big predators with like lions. Then you'll see like the, the medium predators with things like cheetahs and then the smaller predators with like different kinds of foxes and stuff like that. Um, and that's typically what you'd see. And even looking back at, you know, the mammal fossil record, you usually see that, but you don't see that here. So first they were like, well, is this a, do we just, are we just missing fossils? Like, are, should they be here? And through different sampling techniques, you can, they could tell that, uh, no, we, we, sh if they were here, we should have found them by now. So what they concluded was that the medium sized predator, you know, niche was being filled by the young giants how long i mean how long was there a gap that needed to be filled there like in terms of like how long an individual lived is that what you mean yeah um so they they actually especially with things like t-rex because we have great t-rex fossils through most of its life um 
they would grow at roughly the same sort of rate as a person. So they'd be fully grown by like their early twenties. Okay. Um, and, but for, you know, those teen years, they basically would be, you know, the cheetah to the adults lion. <laughs> what does if that, that mean? If, if that analogy makes sense, help me make it sense. So, like I said, if, you know, if we compare it to like a modern ecosystem today with like lions being sort of the biggest, you know, largest predator in their environment, um, the sort of next size down would be like a cheetah. And in this Mm -hmm. scenario, T-Rex and its relatives were taking up both of those, you know, slots in their environment. Which is just yeah, okay. interesting that. that they were filling different, you know, roles throughout their life, which is not uncommon. Um, because still notable. You d- yeah, because you, you don't want to have your babies competing for food with your adults because mm-hmm. the babies will lose because they're babies. Uh, I mean, I've never fought a baby, but <laughs> I feel like I'd win. Uh <laughs> Yep. Anyway, after a comment like that, I feel like it's time to end the episode. So this was a long, slightly confusing episode, but I think this is a a decent framework to sort of build a a future episode about any of these individual groups of dinosaurs later on. This one was a bit technical, um, but you know, sometimes, sometimes you gotta, you, you gotta do some reading before you can I don't know where that was going. Take us out, Mike. <laughs> I'm That's why you come to us. You get you get uh, some fun things, and you get the real technical stuff and everything in between. And this has been a really technical episode 104 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. I need my plan. I need to plan my lesson for tomorrow. And that is Gavin. <laughs> he is going to go ahead and gonna go to bed. Until then, we will see you guys in two weeks. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Finella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.